start yeah. recording. Uh, yeah, so it's it's always nice with my Australian friends living in the future because you can give us a bit of an update as to what's happening in the world, yeah. <laughs> what to expect, yeah. what's coming down the pipe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> nothing too much uh, happens here in the Antipodes because uh, uh, we're so far away from everything. Uh, so everything's very easy going, and uh, uh, it, it's very beautiful weather because it's summer for us. Oh yes. And we just celebrated our typical summer Christmas, and uh, it's beautiful weather. The temperatures around about, or oh, something like, because uh, about thirty degrees. Oh wow! Uh, of course, yeah. that's centigrade. Yeah, that's what uh, it's it, for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a and uh, it gets about down to, down to in the winter it gets down to about twenty. So there's <laughs> only ten degrees summer to winter. Yeah. It's yeah. it's minus four today here in London. It's minus four. Minus it's foggy. I'm wearing a scarf in the house. The heating is on. It's on fully, uh, but it, I'm wearing a scarf in the house. And um, look, I I married a Middle Eastern lady 13 years ago, and my impression of that was that I was going to get some kind of half the year here, half the year there kind of deal rolled into yeah. the the agreement. Didn't happen. We just live here mostly. Yeah. Visit for a few yeah. weeks. <laughs> Yeah. So my my dream, you know, my my sunny dream hasn't come to fruition just yet. But I wonder, you know, at forty seven now, have I have I maybe become too acclimatized to my country? You know, perhaps I can't I can't move on anymore. You know, when it's like you have your cup of tea or your coffee one way, and you pop into the local shop, and every time they say what will it be today, or you know, you're gonna order the same thing every single time. Well, that's where I am. I can't move. I can't move yes. anymore. I'm institutionalized for London, I think. And that's, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a good and a bad thing. It's a nice city. So we were talking about uh, T-Rex. Boranjour, is that what the, the local name for it is? Modern day T-Rex sightings. And I was, I was fascinated. I thought, surely this is this is a folkloric thing. Or thing from the, you know, the age of exploration with travelers coming back with big tales about what they found in in the bush but apparently not yes yeah, so that's correct uh, so uh i w had never heard of uh any reports of anything and as, as astounding as a surviving uh bipedal carnivorous dinosaur uh until i purchased a copy of rex and heather gilroy's a book, and I've got copies of them here. I think I first uh, read about this in one in a, a, a magazine article, uh, and of course I found it really hard to believe that uh, we could have uh, an animal distantly related to Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, of course, the T. Rex has never existed anywhere else but uh, North America, and. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe there was a, uh, the relatives in uh, in in Eurasia, uh, and but the uh, Australian dinosaurs uh, were on Gondwana. Gondwana is the supercontinent, and wow. begun to slowly break apart. But uh, South America was still joined to Antarctica and joined to Australia and new guinea and uh, uh uh africa i think had broken away about uh some time previously but they're all joined together but uh, uh and, and they know that uh, the fossils that they found in south america of both uh, uh dinosaurs and other uh life forms uh, uh they found um, related forms uh, uh, in Australia and Antarctica, and of course, even today, Australia shares uh, its animals and plants with South America. Mm. So uh, our marsupials all came from a uh, a little pygmy possum that still survives today in the uh, in the far South American 
uh, a temperate rainforest, mm -hmm. nothophagus forest, Antarctic beach forests. So that's the layer, and the uh, uh, genetic studies on it uh, discovered that it was related to the Australian marsupials, and so it's believed that this little uh, uh, pygmy possum, a very small po possum, related to the opossums uh, of North and South America. Uh, <laughs> they had also spread across Antarctica oh. because during the uh, Cret Cretaceous, the the uh, the <laughs> the planet was a tropical world. There was no permanent ice or snow anywhere, uh, and and uh, Antarctica uh, was covered in in forests, <laughs> probably subtropical forests, wow. uh, and and also temperate forests, and uh, uh, and the animals and plants had all adapted to uh, surviving cold. Uh, dark winters. So for three months of the year, uh, just as presently occurs, the sun doesn't uh, rise above the Antarctic or South Pole horizon. Mm. And so it's permanently dark for about three months of the year, I think it is. Uh, <coughs> and of course, these days, that's a time when the Antarct in, the, in Antarctica, the, the emperor penguins breed. Mm. But uh, <coughs> that 100 million years ago, uh, <coughs> Uh, it was covered in forests uh, and with dinosaurs. And, wow. and uh, so Australia was right near the South Pole. I think the South Pole was in uh, western New South Wales. And Australia was joined, of course, to Antarctica. Uh, and then, uh, but there was a great rift going on. And so it was, Australia was uh, was slowly pulled apart by the, by the, uh, the, the liquid rock the magma flowing north about 100 kilometres below our feet. Uh, and and so Australia was slowly uh, dragged north uh, wow. away from the South Pole, leaving Antarctica there by itself. But uh, so uh, we know that uh, the Australian uh, paleontologists have found uh, <coughs> wonderful uh, uh, of dinosaurs uh, in Victoria uh, wow. and and also in particularly in Queensland the, the, just recently they found a new plesiosaur uh, there was oh. va a vast inland sea and it was a full array of, of dinosaurs as in the rest of the world so we had those like those titanosaurs those mm -hmm. massive sauropod dinosaurs we had carnivorous dinosaurs we don't have uh, a, 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 a a very large array of, of fossils. So uh, <laughs> we only had bits and pieces of some things. We know there was pterosaurs, uh, and uh, but we, we we know that the, uh, the 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 ecosystems in South America uh, were. Well, it says hello. Oh, we read that <laughs> some sign came up just then, a oh. and so yes, yeah, so. <laughs> said, are we ready to chat? <laughs> and so, yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the the ecosystems in South America, where they're finding all kinds of fabulous fossils, mm. uh, uh, and and Australia and Antarctica uh, were very similar. So we know we had all kinds of fabulous dinosaurs, oh. just like across the rest of the world. And then, of course, as we know, uh, 66 million years ago, an asteroid hit North America in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, uh, and it exterminated virtually all life in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and the only survivors uh, were were the animals in the southern hemisphere, in particular, okay. the furthest from the uh, the impact. Okay. And the interesting thing, the interesting thing about that that impact, uh, if it had hit almost anywhere else on Earth. <laughs> It wouldn't have wiped out the dinosaurs, I don't believe, and oh. uh, uh, and we wouldn't be talking now, <laughs> and, and uh, the dinosaurs would be here instead, and, uh, 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 and and perhaps the dinosaurs may have evolved intelligent species the way the mammals uh, evolved intelligent species, like the great apes and ourselves, uh -huh. and uh, so so instead of the Earth having a uh, <laughs> Relatives of chimpanzees communicating, 
on on Skype. It might have been intelligent dinosaurs. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, not, not great big ones, of course. The same thing. It would have been, uh, you know, yeah. uh, that they, they were well suited to be to develop in, intelligence because you know they were many of the species were sort of our size and bipedal, and uh, uh, and and there was species that were at hunting mammals at night and had uh-huh. sort of forward facing eyes and what have you, and they could have evolved intelligence and perhaps Maybe. there'd be a yeah a dinosaur there might be a, a, a dinosaur uh a, a, a technologically advanced civilization that um that that's been exploring the stars for sure. 10 or 15 million <laughs> years by now China if, North. if it wasn't for that yeah but yeah. that asteroid hit in the worst possible place apparently it hit limestone beds and it created uh, a, a, a terrible uh, sulfuric acid uh, that rained down all over the world and really devastated the ecosystems. Okay. And the only things that survived were deep sea fish. So things like the the, the Nautilus was the yeah. last of the ammonites that's still swimming around today. A wonderful shell with a little yeah. octopus like like tentacles and uh, and yeah, and a brown banded. Yeah, beautiful beautiful things. Uh, and uh, uh, and a number of different species survived: mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, of course. And then they spread uh, across the planet over millions of years uh, and recolonised the earth and, and we're the result of it. Wow. Uh, and and so the interesting thing is the the, uh, the the Gondwana land was the only place where dinosaurs could have survived. There was no chance of them surviving in the northern hemisphere where virtually like 99% of everything was exterminated, all the plants and animals. But uh, uh, but but uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates survived in Gondwana land, at least in parts of Gondwana land. Uh, and the the dinosaurs and the plesiosaurs at that time were adapted to cold, frigid conditions during the winter when it was pitch black, and the plesiosaurs were swimming in in cold oceans, and uh, uh, and so, if any place dinosaurs wow. could have survived was was in South America or Australia or Africa, huh. and so one wonders are those reports that that um, we've read where uh, a sauropod-like dinosaur, the Michele Mbembe, yeah. in uh, the Congo, theoretically there's a possibility dinosaurs could have survived in Africa, South America. There's been the odd sort of report of red. Uh, and, but I didn't realise there'd been reports in Australia, uh, oh. and it was, wasn't until Rex and Heather Gilroy, who were like the, uh, the the father and mother of cryptozoology in Australia, because mm. they um, Rex Gilroy uh, is a, a naturalist and he's very much invo- interested in entomology and uh, the insects and. Uh, and and uh, uh, geology and he was into cave exploration. Uh, I've known them personally for many years uh, and uh, he set up a museum, natural history museum at, at Mount York in the Blue Mountains behind Sydney uh, and uh, and that's when I first came across him and had, had a look at all his insect specimens and rock specimens mm-hmm. and other things, natural history specimens uh, and uh, and that was around about, I don't remember, 1970, 71, something or other like that. Wow, okay. Uh, and, and then... A little while. And then, yeah, and then he set up, because he, he's, a, I think he's about five years older than I, uh, three, three or four years older than I am, and I'm 75. Okay. So, so uh, and then he, then he, he set up uh, a couple of other natural history museums, larger ones. He had one at Wilberforce, I think it was, on the outskirts of Sydney. Uh, and then he, uh, he also had one uh, at Tamworth. Uh, but I visited his his uh, wonderful uh, cryptozoological museum that he set up in the Blue Mountains of Katoomba at Echo Point. And I visited okay. him there. And, and, and I, I spent a, a week or two, a couple of weeks in the Blue Mountains, 1981, and uh, and I often visited him at his museum. We had discussions and what have you. And so w- w- what happened, of course, he uh, 
he had, would have many visitors coming through his museum and they'd be asking him to identify things. And, and, uh, uh, and, and that particularly they'd be asking about, about the identification of animals that were uh, completely unknown to science. And so he began to record all of these and he got extremely interested in them. And, uh, and so he brought out uh, a, 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 a number of books. He began by, he got really interested in reports of, of, um, of, of large gorilla-like or hairy man-like animals and um, uh, Tasmanian tiger-like animals that were supposed to have gone extinct in 1936 in Tasmania and, and <coughs> hundreds of years earlier on the mainland or even thousands of years earlier, he was getting reports from people who had said, you know, oh, I've, I've seen this striped dog-like animal and, uh, and he said, oh, you know, that sounds interesting, that sounds like uh, the Tasmanian tiger is not supposed to be surviving and, and then he also received lots of reports of big cat-like animals uh, uh, which which uh, um, could be in, in a released or escaped um, true big cats feral to Australia because Australia doesn't have mm. um, big cats we have marsupials uh, as I said earlier our animals are related to um, South America and our plants uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so then uh, these reports sounded very much to him like it was the marsupial lion an animal called Thylacolea carnifex. Wow. Uh, Australia had all these fabulous large animals, and we know them, of course, the same way we know about the other animals that went extinct in, in Eurasia and North America and South America. Uh, there's lots of fossils, particularly from caves, uh, uh, but also from uh, uh, limestone pools where, where uh, <coughs> animals fell into limestone pools and were preserved uh, but the, but the megafauna uh, the very large animals uh, were, they found lots of uh, fossils of those uh, and and uh, they survived until at least 40,000 years ago then some of them some of the species may have survived longer uh, and but um, of course the indigenous Australians the first na nation Australians generally known as Aboriginal people we know that they've been here uh, for something like 60,000 years. Uh, from like, uh, they even found a, uh, what appears to be a hearth uh, in a fireplace wow. uh, down on the Victorian coast that's been dated at 120,000 years. Uh, but, but, but we know that Aboriginal people have been here at least 60,000 years, so they must have lived amongst these giant uh, Australian animals, uh, and and because the, uh, the 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 because of the ice ages and the and dry conditions and the spread of grasslands, uh, we had these giant mammals evolve all over the earth. So of course the most famous ones in in Eurasia are things like mammoths and woolly rhinoceroses and mm. cave lions and cave bears, and in South America you had the the giant sloths and the giant armadillos, glyptodonts and various things. So Australia, we had uh, the, the marsupials grew to enormous sizes. So we had many species of giant kangaroo that stood around about three metres tall. Goodness. We had giant wombat-like animals or giant koala-like animals that were about the size of hippopotamuses or rhinoceroses. Uh, and uh, we had uh, these uh, big carnivores feeding on them, which included uh, a, a, a terrestrial crocodile mm. uh, a, and also uh, a, a giant goanna, a giant monitor li lizard. Uh, and, uh, and and so these, these the giant monitor, for instance, reached a length of about 10 metres, it's about 30 feet, something like that. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, so we had big Tasmanian devils. We had uh, giant tortoises that were um, had horns on their heads and, and club <laughs> tails. Uh, and uh, we had uh, giant birds. We had a giant duck or goose as related to the surviving magpie goose. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, emus, of course, and kangaroos are things that we have today and koalas. So there was, the country was covered in these 
giant uh, marsupials, just the same way these giant animals existed all over the world. They seem to go extinct in Australia first. Mm. Uh, and it could be that because Australia has a very poor climate, and as mm. most people know, Australia's majority of it's, it's arid, it's, you know, it's, it's desert, um, yeah. though we do yeah. get... We do get rains and, uh, and and floods and what have you. So they're not deserts like the Sahara. They're covered in vegetation, but uh, the rainfall is irregular. Uh-huh. So uh, it's scrub. It's more like a scrubland. That, that's right. It's more like a scrubland um, or, or, uh, and uh, or spinifex grass, so like grasslands, uh, tufted grass growing right on sand. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the uh, or, or, or small trees called mulga trees. Uh, and, uh, and and a whole array of different species, all adapted to the desert. And all the Australian animals, they are, uh, Australia was originally covered in rainforest. Mm. And as the as the continent drifted north and is being dragged north at about six centimeters a year. Yeah, I've read that so, recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's quite drifting, remarkable. Really? Yeah, and and so we're moving into the tropics slowly. But the interesting thing is, once Australia broke away from Antarctica. Uh, the cold Antarctic currents circulating Antarctica, uh, no longer being interrupted by Australia attached to Antarctica, um, it acted as a planet-sized refrigerator, and that began to cool the planet down. And also when uh, South America and North America joined up, uh, it it also um, changed the uh, currents in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, and all of that apparently was responsible for the ice ages. Wow. And so we had these 17 million years of ice ages. Uh, but the interesting thing, as the planet grew colder, the Australian continent was drifting into the, into the warmer region so that the climate stayed uh, the same in Australia. It's very been, it's been very stable. And consequently, we've got prehistoric... It's full of prehistoric animals and plants, some of the most ancient animals and plants. We've got lungfish... Uh, living in freshwater rivers at about a metre long that haven't changed in 350 million years. They're exactly the same. We've got platypuses that we've got their fossils. They live for 60 months and 60 million years in out of condition. So things like kangaroos and wombats and koalas. And they're all remarkable animals, as, as people generally know. Uh, and uh, so so um, all of these really ancient animals survived. Uh, and and then the Rex and Heather Gilroy began to receive reports of, uh, of, of astounding animals that we wouldn't expect to survive. And the, these are these sauropod not, not. It, it received a few reports of sauropods as well wow. from New Guinea, the island of New Guinea. Mm. Uh, very few, uh, and uh, uh, but but the greatest number of reports they received was from a T. Rex-like animal, uh, and, and and so it wouldn't be a true T. Rex, but it um, apparently closely resembles one. Wow. And so I've got a couple of their books here. Yeah. And. Yeah. And if you want to read more about these animals, this is Out of the Dream Time, but The Search for Australia's Unknown Animals by Rex oh, and God. Heather Gilroy, and that's it there. And oh, there's an God. illustration of that uh, T-Rex-like animal. Uh, wow. <laughs> and and, uh, and that's, that's a wonderful book, and, and it can be... There it is. There, of course, that's oh, the, wow. it's, it's a great big thick book. But anyway, um, it, it's it's available through Uru Publications. Uh, and, and here's a picture of Rex and Heather Gilroy. Oh, yeah. so that's that's a picture. I've seen that a few yeah. times. Yeah, and I often yeah. read uh, their, their website as well. Well, what kind yeah. of areas in Australia is this? Um, T-Rex-like creatures spotted. Are they in swampy rainforest-like conditions or more of the arid desert areas? Yeah, mostly in the arid desert areas. And here's a, a book that they've produced. This is really oh, a God. fascinating book this, because this is just devoted to um, barren jaw. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so the search for Australia's living Tyrannosaurus. And wow. so, and so mo- most of the reports they've received... Uh, 
over the over the decades of people coming in and chatting with them at their museums uh, 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 came from arid Australia, mm. from from sort of fairly remote areas, uh, and the reports are all the same. Um, it sounds very much like a, ter a terrestrial bipedal uh, carnivorous dinosaur that looks very much like like a T Rex. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I said, he's got, they, they've got about 36 reports uh, that they've picked over wow. the years, and they've gone looking for them. The you know, Rex and Heather, um, they've uh, undertaken more uh, field expeditions than mm. anybody else over the decades, uh, and uh, they've even found footprints, uh, and I can show you those footprints. But so... So the Baron Jaw, and I'm just saying it, and telling you exactly what I've read in, the, in their books, sure, sure. and and that Baron Jaw is is the uh, is an Aboriginal name I think from the Kimberleys, okay. uh, and the description of the animal is that it it's uh, uh, an animal that hunts at night, and now because most people would think oh no it's no chance in the world that a, there'd be a a T Rex like animal still surviving today because we know all the dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. And theoretically, if they did survive um, in the intervening 66 million years, we should have found fossil evidence of it, you would think. However, uh, uh, the, uh, the fossil record, of course, is, a, is very sparse. Yeah. If, if something didn't fall into a, a small pool or whatever, um, or didn't, or what didn't end up in a cave or something. Largely uh, an incidental record, isn't it? I yeah, mean, that's right, yeah. An, an incidental record. But so, but um, and most people think, well, that's not possible because you know we know what T. Rex look like from Jurassic Park, and they're they're these huge dinosaurs that charge all over the place, eating everything. Yeah. But of course, uh, that's a that's a <laughs> that's not a true. A picture of any carnivore and it's the same thing we thought about lions and tigers and everything that you know they would rush around eating everybody and eating everything but of course a carnivore doesn't really know that it's big and frightening uh you know it's it's it, it's an and just another animal living in a, in an ecosystem of animals and uh and uh they they don't regard themselves as something that can just go charging around doing whatever they like because the animals that they feed on uh, are adapted to avoiding them or defending themselves. So so uh, uh, you know just say a lion uh, or a tiger, uh, any of these big carnivores attacking uh, their their prey um, always run the risk of being injured, uh, and of course they've also run the risk of meeting up with other prides of lions, for instance, and and, and male lions trying to take over uh, prides and take over the, the females, etc. So, so all of these animals, uh, although they might be big and fierce, uh, uh, they're, they're not unbelievably brave, say, you know, they don't come charging around in the daytime. That, yeah, they're not uh, reckless. That's right, reckless. Exist within and certain so, behaviours and with certain prey animals at the optimum times for hunting. I mean, it makes perfect sense, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so th so these so the description interesting the descriptions of these of these uh, T Rex like animals surviving today uh, is that uh, <laughs> as you would expect from a predator uh, 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 predators. Uh, only need to feed occasionally because you know they're feeding on on uh, um, wonderful high protein foods, uh, but then they've got to spend the time digesting the food. And as we know, with lions and tigers, if you read about them, uh, watch them in documentaries, they'll say, "Oh, they spend twenty hours a, a day sleeping," uh, because all animals conserve energy. Uh, we don't need to conserve energy because we've got our technology, but normally you do not run around wasting energy uh, uh, if food is f fairly hard to come by. And so uh, a, a predator, say a lion or a tiger, uh, it, uh, they spend most of their time resting 
and then they go out hunting and they usually hunt at night because that's uh, it, there's less chance of their of their prey uh, avoiding them. Uh, and of course, they're very careful that they sneak around. They're 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 all ambush predators, mm. uh, and so the reports that the <coughs> Gilroys have picked up on this surviving T Rex like animal is that it sleeps during the day, mm. uh, and and in, in remote canyons in in remote country, uh, and it's relatively inactive. Uh, 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 and then it, it comes out at night wow. and and uh, and then it slowly stalks around um, hiding in vegetation because uh, it doesn't, you know, if you're an ambush predator, you've got to be as cryptic as possible. You, know, yeah. you don't move her out in the open so that your potential prey species will see you. So they spend all of their time hiding. And if you go to so you went to India or Southeast Asia and you wanted to see a tiger. Well, they're not just walking around like they're in the zoo or something. You know, they're almost impossible to see. Yeah. Because yeah. They, they're not worried so much about being seen by people. You know, their main concern is not being seen by the animals that, that they wish to hunt. Mm. So they just lie in wait. And so this is uh, uh, the, the reports that have been received of, of this T-Rex-like animal that they they uh, just stand quietly uh, in thickets of trees watching, uh, and then uh, if they really do exist, they would have been feeding on kangaroos and emus and um, previously the megafauna, uh, and and uh, <laughs> they make a sudden dash out when they see something that's liable to be to be able to be caught. Uh, they can't run very far because they just like a, a lion tiger a cheetah or anything yeah. um they they lose they lose they use up a lot of energy uh, and uh, and so they 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 only run a short distance so they'll wait till some um prey species um uh, uh, wanders close enough feeding and then they'll they'll they'll, they'll break from their cover and wow. grab the animal and take it back uh, and and feed on it and then and of course that's that's as much as they move you know they're they're relatively inactive just like any predatory animal. I, I suppose out there in their environment as well there'd be plenty of kangaroos, plenty of camels, wild camels too probably. Emus, yes, exactly. Other things like that, large prey that could satiate a a big predator yes. like that. Uh, and so they and they so they <laughs> the, the 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 encounter reports are always of them hearing them snorting and hearing their their um, heavy footsteps. Uh, and so Rex and, Gather, Rex and Heather have uh, uh, collected, as I said, about 36 reports. And so one of the most spectacular reports, uh, and you've got to imagine what Australia's like, it's about the size of Europe yeah. or, say, mainland United States. Mm. Uh, but we've got about, I think, about 28 million people all of which are concentrated in in four or five cities on the coast. Uh, and so you can imagine Europe or North America with one road around the, uh, it's an island continent, so one road around the coast, and then one road that runs north-south through the centre, through Alice Springs, wow. and then a couple of roads that run uh, east-west. And, and most of those roads you need a four-wheel drive vehicle because they're <laughs> and plenty of uh, plenty of uh, uh, supplies and provisions just in case as well. I would imagine. Yes, and, and then of course there's it's covered in roads just like any other place uh, in the areas that have been settled hmm. uh, by British and European settlers uh, and set, set established farms and cities and so the whole of Eastern Australia. Uh, particularly southeastern Australia is covered in roads and farms, yeah. but we have fabulous uh, mountain ranges, uh, and our mountain ranges they're not like uh, the mountains in in Eurasia or North America, for instance, uh, because as this own continent so ancient, uh, uh, we have these uplifted plateau mountains, uh, uh, particularly sandstone mountains mm -hmm. around in the Sydney area, is particularly spectacular and rugged, and they have sheer 
uh, escarpments or cliffs, uh, wow. hundreds of meters or hundreds of feet. Uh, and, and so they're very rugged, like you can hardly, they look very much like the Grand Canyon, uh -huh. uh, except covered in forest. Uh, and and this, there's those areas that you get reports of, of, of animals that aren't supposed to exist. Uh, and there's, the, the majority of these reports come from, as I said, Central Australia and Northern Australia and Western yeah. Australia. And uh, and so uh, one of my, my favourite reports that they picked up uh, it, it took place near Cooper Pedy, which is well known for people that are interested in opals, because one of the, the most wonderful opal uh, uh, hunting areas, and uh, most of the town is underground because it's very hot and dry. Uh, and so this particular story, it, it took place um, with a, a retired couple, opal hunting, uh, you know, searching along creek beds and what have you, out in the desert. And they were camped one night with their dog, Toby, by the campfire and uh, and uh, enjoying a beautiful night. And the dog began to growl at something. And it was a full moon night and the dog headed off into the, into the scrub so it's sort of like sm small trees. There might be the yeah. highest trees might be 15 or 20 feet high okay. or, or, or lower uh, and uh, and um, large numbers of shrubs and, and grasses and 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 uh, uh, and the plants usually separated by by to sort of bare uh, sandy soil. And uh, uh, and so it's lovely full moon and the dog uh, started growling and then went off uh, <laughs> into the into the scrub uh, and then sometime some minutes later it suddenly came running back uh. and ran past them and went in under the car wow. you know, under the, the car and and so the husband thought well what on earth scared the dog because you know they they know everything that lives out in the desert you know, there might might be feral camels. Um, mm. When camels were introduced, we used to have Afghan camel uh, trains uh, carrying transport a hundred years ago through the deserts in Australia, and now the place is full of camels. Uh, and uh, or there could be wild goats, feral goats, or kangaroos, or emus, uh, or wild pigs. Pigs were introduced, so but nothing that was is really aggressive or would frighten a dog, and so. The husband decided, well, he'll go and have a look and see what what scared the dog. So he heads off into the bush uh, in the full moon. He can see well, and uh, he he walks. On a, he does. I'm not quite sure how far. Maybe you know three or four hundred feet or whatever. He's wondering what on earth frightened the dog so badly, and so then he suddenly realizes that there's a there's a large dark shape directly in front of him, maybe 20, 30, 40 feet in front of him or whatever. And so he walks up to it because he thinks it can only be a camel or, or something. Uh. And uh, and he, he shines, that turns his torch on uh. to illuminate it. And what he sees is what looks like a T-Rex bending down, holding a cow. Uh. And then it stands up with his cow in its jaws and then it drops the cow onto the ground to sort of break it up a bit and it bends down and it takes a big chunk out of it and it's eating it Goodness and he's standing man. there <laughs> illuminating a t-rex eating <laughs> a cow that has just killed or, or whatever what does he do and, uh, and then he's standing there in shock and disbelief i guess because the last thing you'd expect to see yeah. When you're out camping in the bush is a is a is a t-rex like something out of and this happened quite a few years ago probably mm. before uh, uh, uh jurassic Big park movie. Came yeah out. yeah and and uh, so then and suddenly then he's standing there with a torch on it you got a bright torch uh, and then it's it begins to get interested in <laughs> what's this <is> light <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so it <laughs> It starts taking an interest in him. Oh, no. So he, of course, turns around and runs for his life. Uh -huh. 
back to the camp and he runs into the camp and he says to his wife, quick, quick, into the car. We're going, get into the car. We're going, get into the car. Mm. And, uh, of course, she thinks, what? What on earth's going on? No, what, I'm not getting into the car. Why should we get up? Why should we leave? And he's saying, this, 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 it's, <laughs> it's, it's, there's something there's something terrible coming or whatever. Get mm. in the car. He's yelling at her to get in the car, and she's refusing to get into the car mm. because why on earth would they want to? Why, you must have gone mad. And then suddenly she can hear thump, 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 <laughs> thump. <laughs> Some very loud bipedal footsteps coming through through the grass and vegetation <laughs> and snorts, loud snorts. <laughs> and she oh. she thinks, I think, <laughs> I think I, I will get <laughs> out. I think we'll come in the car and go, this doesn't sound good. And so they they uh they jump in the car and then and then uh and then they're wondering what's happened to the dog, and then they realise the dog's in the car already. It had jumped in, <laughs> and uh, and then they, as they drove away, the um, they see this T Rex-like animal um, break through the vegetation and standing near their fire as they oh, drove. My goodness! <laughs> so, my goodness! Isn't that a fantastic, a fantastic, it's a, it's an amazing story? And it's a good lesson in it. Listen to your pets. You know they know, <laughs> especially dogs. If they tell you something's yeah. up something is yeah. up <laughs> yeah that, so interestingly enough um i mean i found like with most cryptozoological stories you, you think well um maybe these things exist maybe they don't or whatever like i mean the problem with cryptozoology it's all anecdotal stories yeah and of course. And, and, and you don't know if there's any reality to them and the only way you can tell is if there is uh, 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 um, uh, other stories coming in if other people are reporting uh seeing a similar animal with similar behavior uh, uh, uh and of course that's why we found that australia is a uh, crypto cryptozoological treasure house because especially with the internet now and you and i talking um uh, uh, many people have got interested uh in in the reports of these unknown animals uh, of course the majority of the population don't believe them for a second because they're all city dwellers and as we know as city dwellers you live amongst uh, 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 huge numbers of strangers so it's the perfect place for swindlers and hoaxers and liars and cheats and everything because you, you can pretty much um, get away with most things as long as, as, long, as yeah. long as it doesn't it doesn't involve the police or whatever you can you can be you can be saying or doing anything and, and almost and, and with a fair chance of getting away if it isn't too illegal or whatever. Yeah. You could certainly have hopes or you could lie to people. But most of these reports come from people that live in the bush because city people don't encounter these animals, obviously. And country people, of course, it's a different situation altogether. You can't be a, a liar or a hoaxer or a swindler in the bush because everyone knows each other. Because, yeah. um, you know, in Australia is full of these small country towns, might only be a few hundred people. And yeah. so everyone's honest because they've grown up. Everyone knows everybody else. You can't get away with anything. And if you, and if you get a be, bad reputation, that's that's it. That's your that's your end. You can't do business. You can't have social relationships anymore. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So so and all these reports come from uh, rural people, and and and, uh, and then so the interest and the interesting thing is. Most of these people hardly mention it themselves because you've got a reputation. So if if you're in the back paddock and you've met a T Rex, uh. you're not likely to tell anyone <laughs> because you, you don't want anyone to think, to think you're a lunatic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I spoke to somebody about that recently about Bigfoot sightings and people were reporting Bigfoot sightings. And I said it's not the same as seeing Nessie or something. You don't get a pat on the back and or like a, a milestone marker. What's likely if you go public with a Bigfoot sighting, especially in environments such as this, is that your bosses will find out and maybe you don't get the next promotion or maybe people don't invite you to the bar because you're like, well, that's Andy and he's a bit, he thinks there's a Bigfoot, you know, or he said he saw a T-Rex out in the countryside. Let's uh, Let's skip that one. We don't want to be hearing about 
and his T-Rex again for the rest of, yeah. the, you know, the dinner party or whatever. And I, I think it's yeah. just normal. It's normal that people, and that's why I think there's a lot more sightings than people of all kinds of things. And people yes. would have, would admit, especially as you say, out in rural areas, Australia, South America, wherever else, where it's it's not seen, it's not good to start drawing attention to yourself with strange, strange tales. That's right. And so, because uh, for for twenty uh, for um, uh, twenty six years, I've been broadcasting a wildlife identification program for ABC North Coast Local yeah. Radio, and in fact. Um, we've just come back from our, uh, our Christmas holidays, like the the, um, uh, the the radio station. It, it continues broadcasting, but the local uh, uh, ra- the local uh, uh, broadcasters uh, stop stop broadcasting till about a week before Christmas, and now yeah. uh, it's only just started this Saturday again. And so I did right. my first. Um, radio program again and so what and so this is the beginning of the 27th year and so over that time i've received you know maybe a hundred reports of animals unknown to australian cryptos or unknown to australian zoology mm. uh, and and uh, and the and the, the people uh, some people will actually phone up and talk about what they've seen on air but most people uh they want to tell they want to report what they've seen because it, you know, it, it fascinates them. I mean, they've seen something that's not supposed to exist. Uh, uh, and also they might want to tell people because the animal could be potentially dangerous because mm. there's been a lot of reports of things like black panthers and, and American mountain lions or some big cat-like animal. Uh, uh, and so what happens is the farmers will talk amongst themselves, but only to those that have also seen one. Because obviously you say, oh, I've seen a black panther, and everyone's going to say, oh, no, you probably saw a, a neighbour's cat. <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, what have you been drinking? And, and in fact, uh, in 1981-82, I spent three months in the Grampians in Western Victoria, wow. uh, and uh, I was identifying the plants and animals and just exploring. I just took some time off to... Um, um, examine a really interesting area, and I was particularly interested in in that area because I'd received, I'd heard of reports of Tasmanian tigers or thylacines, these carnivorous dog-like marsupials, uh, and uh, also reports of black panthers and American mountain lions uh, in the Grampians, uh, and uh, so I uh, began talking to people. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the news, the local newspaper, the Hamilton newspaper, uh, uh, wrote an, a little article with a picture of me. Uh, I, I was there actually to to um, to uh, try to create a bit of publicity about the highly endangered little marsupial called the Eastern Bard Bandicoot, and I mm-hmm. even got to see the Australian Prime Minister, who was uh, the member for that uh, electorate, that area, and uh, and I was surprised that. The mayor and the head of the water board, uh, and a whole array of, of of people working for the Hamilton Council, uh, and uh, forestry workers um, working working in the in the the Grampians is now a national park. Uh, most of them had seen black panthers or big wow. American mountain lion like animals, uh, and. And uh, that they, I, I recorded all their names and the locations and all the information, uh, and and often the the forestry workers, for instance, they would always say <coughs> that um, that one of the other people had talked about seeing this giant black cat or a big brown cat looked like a a mountain lion, and uh, and they were, it, his fellow workers would 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 accuse him of being drunk. <laughs> And then, like one chap saying, and then after he hadn't seen anything and been working there for years, and then one day suddenly there's there's two of the animals, and uh, right across the road, and and one ran downhill, one went up, ran uphill, and they, and it couldn't get away. Like they're looking at a perfect close view of it from only a few meters away. It was on a sort of a rocky slope, right near their car, and so they had a really good look, and and uh, uh, and then. Uh, and then, of course, they told the the, the head uh, the foreman 
uh, or, or the head ranger or whatever, and he didn't believe them until he was in a car with them and suddenly there was another huh. one. Uh, and uh, they'd say, oh, you know, now everyone says that well, I've been drinking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but seeing, you know, seeing exactly... is believing. And um, and I don't, I don't blame people for not believing in that which they haven't seen because the most logical conclusion to come to is the person that's telling you the story has made some kind of mistake, isn't it? Yes. Especially with creatures that are not supposed to exist or not supposed to exist anymore. Um, yes. Yeah, you must have made some kind of mistake. I'd rather believe that you had an an incident of um, misperception than a real experience, because that brings up so many more questions. And then I think sometimes for a lot of people, it threatens the fabric of this reality that we have. You know, yeah, that's that's completely true. More. Yeah, no, that's that's right. And say, say a lot of people, if they're religious or they've had a, you know, brought up in a religious background, oh, I can't be real because you know it doesn't mention it in the Bible or something. Um, and but but the most common thing these days is well, you know, um, if it's not in the zoo or in a museum, it can't exist. If you don't see it in the picnic area, it can't exist. Or you know, in a David Attenborough documentary, if we haven't seen it on David Attenborough, then it, it can't possibly exist. Oh, yeah, David, yeah. And besides that, I mean, there's plenty of animals we know to exist that don't feature in any zoo collections or museum collections anywhere. You know, they're just not uh, considered uh, an attraction to people. Now, uh, just before we, we finish up, I just want to, uh, as we've talked about, I'm popping over to Australia in April yes. for the conference, <laughs> looking forward to, to seeing everybody and getting out there. I, I But I just want to sort of draw attention to your work and let people know where they can find you, where they can get uh, read your books and your works or tune into the the radio show. How should they find you? What's the best place? And, well, well, let me first tell you a couple of really exciting reports that I've just received on these oh, T-Rexes. Yeah. And, oh, yes, and, please. Well, what, uh, I received a report, uh, one report, oh, about 20 years, 15, 15 20 years ago. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was in, right in the same area. This was up in the... <coughs> Uh, Gulf of Carpentaria, Cape York area, North Queensland, uh, oh. and, and I was talking to a woman, uh, and when when uh, we we spent a lot of time out in the field, uh, and I was talking to a local woman, and and uh, who'd always lived out that way, and, and I'd always ask people what animals they've seen, and then ask them if they've seen anything unusual or particularly interesting that I'd like to talk about. And uh, uh, and she said, I, uh, her and her husband were working on this station, and uh, the uh, the stockman came riding in and said they'd seen a giant uh, reptile on its hind legs down in a canyon, and they were on the the canyon rim, and they saw this huge reptile like a T Rex. Oh. Uh, and they they got out of there quick smart, and they told the um, the people. Uh, in in the uh, the at the farmhouse, uh, what they'd seen, uh, and of course, but that had happened years ago, uh, and so that's an old report. But um, so that's so I was fascinated to actually receive a report, and that was fifteen twenty years ago. And then just recently, uh, uh, our daughter's partner, uh, he's a tattoo artist, and he was tattooing a gentleman. Uh, and uh, uh, down in in Adelaide, and uh, <laughs> and then they were chatting as he was as he was tattooing, and uh, uh, this chap uh, and, and my uh, and our uh, our daughter's um, partner um, were talking about the animals that they most mm. liked because he he does mainly tattoos of animals. Uh, and snakes and dragons and things like that, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, Matteo, he said, um, you know, his favourite animal is um, is a T Rex, and uh, this chap said, oh, he said, oh, I've never really told anybody, but I actually saw one oh. only about four years ago, and sure enough, it was in the same area where there've been other reports up near, you know, north of a couple of hours north of of uh, Adelaide um, towards that sort of Cooper PD area. Uh, and this, a lot of the reports that uh, Rex and Heather Gilroy have received have been from truck drivers. 
and and they've seen them cross the road. Otherwise, it's drovers and and um, indigenous people, First mm. Nation people. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, this and uh, so he, once again, he was driving a truck uh, uh, at a quarry, and it was. Uh, I think it was like last light or, 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 you know, just very late in the afternoon. And he's driving his truck along a dirt road uh, and he hears um, this thump, 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 thump of some big animal coming up beside the truck. And then he, and then he can hear this snorting. And so he turns off the engine because he's fascinating what on earth is this animal i can hear and turns off the engine and and he's got the window down and he sees a few meters off he suddenly sees hidden in the trees looking at him this head that looked just like a t-rex head <laughs> with um an eye looking at him you can see one eye he said it was like it was like orangey red eye and the interesting he said it had it had grey feathers or black feathers around the eye and, and then on the face and then grey feathers. So it had feathers on the face and he's looking at it and it's only a few metres away. It might, uh, it might be like 20, 30 feet away from him. And it's at the so you're sitting on the, one of these big dump trucks or tip trucks and yeah. the big trucks that carry gravel. So you're, you're about four metres above the ground and the head of this animal was about four metres above the ground, wow. about the same wow. level. And then he's looking at it, and then the head turned towards him, and, and you could see the teeth and the jaws. God. And that's when he decided he was going to start the <laughs> truck and, and drive away. A and then just recently I came across a report uh, from a newspaper from uh, 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 around about a hundred uh, over a hundred years ago, one hundred and fifty years ago, uh, a newspaper report uh, uh, entitled "The Macquarie Bunyip," and Bunyip was the term used by Indigenous people in uh, in Victoria of uh, a, 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 of a seal-like animal, like a freshwater mm. seal, uh, 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 and then so. The uh, and then the uh, the the the, Euro the European or the British people that were settling in Australia uh, and setting up farms, they received a lot of reports of different bunyips um, uh, from from the uh, from the First Nation people uh, and and because they would be warning them, oh, you know, be careful around this area. Mm -hmm. There's an animal like a like a huge huge emu it walks on two legs and it's very frightening and it, wow. you know they, they only move they only you only see them in when the weather warms up uh, and uh, uh, and and so the word bunyip was used for any large animal unknown yeah. animal uh, and of course you know they never knew what was out there uh, <laughs> and so anyway this this macquarie bunyip uh, it, a very remarkable report the the the, uh, the river uh, at Bathurst was was uh, in flood. It was a very flat landscape, mm. and so the river was rising, but there wasn't much noise. And, and two, uh, and this is in the early days of uh, the settlement of, of sort of western central New South Wales. Uh, um, they could hear uh, uh, from their hut, from their house or hut. Uh, near the near the river, they're watching it. The river rise in the moonlight, and uh, and there's a great big gum tree in front of their house, uh, and uh, uh, and one time they heard what sounded like a donkey braying being yeah. carried away by the flood, uh, and then they heard these sounds that sounded like there was an elephant or something that was in trouble. There was these strange vocalizations. And they opened the door to see what it was. And there was what they describe as, as like a gigantuous alligator, <laughs> uh, this huge scaly animal with a big tail. And it was clinging to a tree um, only metres from the um, the floodwaters. It had been caught in the floodwaters uh, <laughs> and uh, the water was rising uh, and uh, it was clinging to this tree <coughs> uh, and uh, 
and they described it as having a two horns, one between its eyes and one on its nose, and otherwise looking like a gigantuous crocodile or alligator, uh, and and uh, 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 and and it's trying to climb higher. And, 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 and in the tree, the weight of this animal and the and the the, the water washing away the 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 uh, uh, the soil, mm. the tree, and this big animal clinging to it. Um, fell over into the water and was washed away wow. uh, but of course but the way the rivers are like the rivers they 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 they've uh, eroded themselves down into the ground so like Australian rivers the land will be flat and then you'll get a uh, uh, 30 40 d foot yeah. deep yeah sort of gully where the river runs okay. so when it rises uh, 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 it, it, it if you're very if you're on the the flood plains the whole floodplain will mm. will um will flood but but most places it only rises up and takes away a bit of the bank but so you can oh, we stand see. quite close to the flooded river yeah. uh, and so they reported that the next day they saw this animal and so so th there's only one that one report and also aboriginal reports of saying an animal talking about it being scaly and you know and and, and scary and what have you yeah. and only occasionally seen there is a possibility that it that it's not a true dinosaur, but uh, one of these terrestrial crocodiles uh, uh -huh. that survived. And then that's another possibility. And I've got <coughs> here's a book. Here's another. This is a book, Catamacar Extinct Vertebrates of Australia. Wow. And and it's got an illustration of one of these terrestrial crocodiles. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. And so there it is there. Wow. And so these were true terrestrial crocodiles. Um, they had they had a hoof like, cl uh, they didn't have claws. They had almost hoof like toes. So running wow. around on the on the on the the ground and uh, uh, more rounded sort of uh, uh, jaws and wow. uh, uh, and serrated teeth like to cut cut into prey, not not uh, the round teeth of crocodiles and alligators yeah. to grab fish and what have and drag them under. So and they that was one of the dominant predators in uh, in Australia. They're supposed to have gone extinct along with the with the with the, all the megafauna, the giant yeah. diprotodons and giant kangaroos and giant emus and wombats and thing like things that existed. Uh, and uh, so there's just a possibility that it's not actually a dinosaur, but surviving uh, these these big terrestrial crocodiles. And who knows? Maybe they actually um, were moving about at times on their hind legs, but that's just oh. another another possibility. You know, yeah, I mean that that's amazing to me. And um, I, although I do have to to wrap up now, I, I I just want to say that to me, what's exciting about Australia is that it's largely uninhabited, and within that sparse uh, habitation of of the land, there is so much room for for things to be without disturbance. And I would assume that the Aboriginal population generally leaves well alone those things which they either consider to be sacred or dangerous from a point of common sense and and culture. So to me, that's it's it is a lost world of sorts, you know, it a is, lost world yes. of sorts, and that there's not a lot of footfall to some of those interior areas. I would imagine. And so here's some nice actual foot. This so this is in the the Gilroy's book Burrenjaw. Oh yeah, and it's available from Uru Publications. You uh -huh. know, just look up Rex and Heather Gilroy, uh, and that's their. Yeah, I'm just yeah, there's their name. It. Yeah, I'll put a link to and, that as well in the interview. And, I'll, I'll put but, a link to the book. But but have a have a look at these footprints that they actually found that look like. T-Rex like footprints. Uh, a little hair. And wow. <laughs> and with young ones, you know, the smaller footprints as if they got young with them. Uh, uh, they they were suggesting that maybe there's some sort of time warp or something or other, but I it isn't because it's, you know, they agree that it's hard to believe that such things yeah. could actually exist today, but they found like a kill site uh and uh, and there's the footprints. Another picture of the footprints. Oh yeah, I see them. Yeah. So, so these these books are available from them, and uh, uh, 
And you know, and they found this group of carcasses of cows that had all been eaten in right beside those footprints out in the desert. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a mystery. Uh, of course, we don't really know what's going on, but it's fascinating, isn't it? So, yeah, and so my name's Gary Oper, G-A-R-Y-O-P-I-T. I've got a, a, a Facebook site called Australian Cryptozoology, Gary Opert. And, uh, yeah, we're having this, uh, this ACRO meeting, Australian Cryptozoological Research Organisation, and we're having a, a, a cryptozoological conference in Newcastle in, in, in May. I think it's May the 18th, I think it is, from, from memory. Um, uh, I'll be... April. A- April? April? Anyway, we'll have to... 22nd, yeah. I'll, I'll also post a link that... to the, the conference as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And there's the ACRO site. I, I, uh, I'll be one of the, the speakers. Uh, we've had, I think we've had three of them so far. Mm. And so this will be the fourth one. But we haven't had one for two or three years because of the pandemic. Yeah. All the fun but, uh, the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so go on those sites and have a look. And I'm, I'm, I've got a, a, my own book, Australian Cryptozoology, but I've been revising it and adding all these extra uh, chapters to it, uh, including this chapter on all taken from Rex and Heather Gilroy's books and, and the other books written by Tony Healy and Paul Cropper and, uh, and, and other researchers that have published books. There's quite a few of them now. Not, I look, quite a few researchers, not too many books have been published. But uh, uh, it, yeah, it's a fascinating subject, and we've got no idea whether these animals actually exist. But uh, when you get large numbers of reports from completely different localities, from different witnesses over a large time scale, and they all describe a similar animal with a similar uh, behaviour, uh, then it looks like these animals could exist. And just imagine if, uh, and and from the old Aboriginal reports. Um, the the the, uh, the 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 indigenous people were saying that they lay big eggs um, that are larger than a large a bluish in colour and larger than an emu egg, uh, and so that's interesting <laughs> that they even reported that these animals laid eggs uh, and and, uh, and sort of moved about at night, and uh, well one would have thought if they really exist then uh, we'd have recent fossils of them or, or, or but but per, perhaps like any predator predators have big territories uh and and uh, and they're, they're they're always hard to find we, we have a little carnivorous marsupial about the size of a cat called a spotted tail quoll and researchers think that it has a territory of about 100 square kilometers and it's only wow. the size of a cat wow <laughs> and uh, though it probably has smaller territories in areas that has a great deal more food. Uh, but, yeah, so but just imagine if there really is a surviving T-Rex-like animal. It's uh, amazing. Yeah. Absolutely it's astounding. Amazing. And that and would be the greatest discovery ever and be well worth searching for. But the only way you could search for something like that, you'd need drones uh, and with heats heat um, seeking in a mm. in infrared you know, and and to you'd be looking for large animals but it's such a vast area and and uh, and these animals if they exist they'd be spread out they probably have big territories and uh, they don't draw attention to themselves and they're obviously not terribly aggressive uh because uh, you know they're not going and killing animals they don't need to eat so they yeah, and but I suppose if you <laughs> encountered one, uh, <laughs> you would just disappear. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, I'm, there and, may be plenty of witnesses a, out there that never live to tell the tale. And, and there's one other report that I came across, uh, uh, written in, in a book about this chap who was looking for um, Lassiter's lost gold mine. There's a it's a famous reef of gold that uh, uh, an explorer or gold prospector found in Central Australia. And uh, or reportedly found, and then he tried to bring it. He gathered an expedition together to go look for it, but he couldn't find it. I think he ended up dying in the desert. But this uh, this chap was searching for his his uh, uh, th- this lost gold mine that's re- or a lost gold a- outcrop somewhere, and uh, uh, he 
he in, encountered a, uh, a a big black cat, like like a black panther or or some giant feral cat, and then he also encountered a, a big wild dog, like a big dingo or wow. feral dog or whatever uh, that he'd seen. He actually saw them fighting, wow. and uh, uh, and then he was searching for this gold mine, and in the and in the and uh, he suddenly came across both the animals that had been killed and that had been like bitten and killed and then wow. he heard heavy footsteps <laughs> coming towards him and he decided whatever's killed these, <laughs> these big predators i'm getting out of here and uh, and he went yeah. for his life and he never saw anything no. uh, but 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 i read that and, and, and i was thinking Mm. Well, what uh, if and who knows if that was a true story? But he wrote it as if it was true. It was a, a series of funny and unusual yeah. tales of, of this bushman. And logic and, dictates uh, that you would you would take the lesson from the large carnivores laying dead before you that whatever's heavy <laughs> stepping around yeah. the corner should be avoided. I've always yeah. asked myself that question as a cryptozoologist. You know, we all want to find these things, but when yeah. alone out there in the bush, face to face. Do you really want to be in that close proximity situation, or would you know either a telephoto lens or a game yeah. cam capture? And I think yeah. I'm in the, yeah. the latter category. Um, yeah. yeah, the game cam and telephoto lens capture is perfectly fine for me. I'll settle for that. Gary, I'm yeah. going to say goodbye uh, and rush okay. off, but thank you so much. And I really look forward to all the links. Everybody will be in the description for Gary's books, Rex's books, and the conference. And I just look forward to catching up in April and yeah, saying. No. Hello to the Australians and, uh, and visiting your beautiful land. Yeah, yeah. And I look forward to actually meeting you face to face. Yeah, that'll be wonderful. And, uh, uh, and, and if you've got the time, we we'll might go up into the mountains and uh, search for T-Rexes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I intend to spend about a week, two weeks around. Stay as long as you can because there's a lot to see and it is very very spectacular uh, and because most people are city dwellers and they just they come to australia they go into the cities oh, and the me. cities are nice like sydney's yeah. magnificent but when you get like the blue mountains and katoomba and janolan caves and stuff these are just absolutely fabulous mind-boggling scenery and when you see how rugged it is with the sheer cliffs and plateaus and escarpments and everything uh, all covered in forest and completely inaccessible uh, 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 you, you think well <laughs> you wonder no wonder uh, 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 people have, have seen animals unknown to science oh, in these localities yeah. uh, uh, and whether they really exist we don't know but it's an interesting mystery but and then let's hope and on visit that we'll we'll find them gary open thank you so much bye, -bye. okay all the best bye